test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You will hear a telephone conversation between a customer and a telephone service representative. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello, Cheap Calls Unlimited. This is Adam O'Shaughnessy. How can I help you? Yes, I heard something on the TV the other day about cheap local and national calls. Do you have a new offer available at the moment? That's right. You would have heard about our special no-limit offer. Oh, how does it work? How can I save? Well... Do you make many calls outside your local area? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. I often call my mother-in-law in Sydney, and sometimes I call Perth and Melbourne. We've got family there. OK, where would you be calling from? Brisbane. Right, this would be perfect for you. How it works is you tell us which city you call the most, and we'll set up a special offer for three cents per minute, no matter what time of the day you call. But it gets better. We also offer 10 cent local calls. No other telephone carrier can offer you such a cheap plan. Wow, that is cheaper than what I currently pay. But what about international calls? I often call America. What are your rates to the States? Our rates to the USA are also competitive. You can call America for 6 cents per minute. This also includes a connection fee of 15 cents. That's competitive, all right. So, how do I sign up? Well. We can do it right here over the phone if you like. Or I can send you out an application form. Or I can email the details with a form attached. Which would you prefer? Well, how long will it take over the phone? Oh, just a matter of four or five minutes. OK, let's do it now. Right then. First off, I need your name and address. OK, my name is Mandy Silverstone. That's S-I-L-V-E-R-S-T-O-N-E. -E. My address is 16 Hazelwood Street, that's H-A-Z-L-E-W-O-O-D Street, Belmont, 4173. Good. Now what about your telephone number, date of birth, and do you have an email address? Yes. The telephone is 5522-3481. My date of birth is July 13th, 1972. And my email address is mandy at telly.com. That's M-A-N-D-Y at T-E-L-E -E dot com. Why do you need my date of birth? Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 7 to 10. Right, OK. Yes, we'll request your date of birth for security reasons. We'll ask you this each time you call us to request information about your account. Not for making a payment, but, uh, you know, if you wish to change any of your details or change your plan, you know, those kind of things. OK, I understand. OK, right. Well, we're finished. Do you have any other questions at all? Yes. When does this new service actually start? Yes, I'm going to send the information to our sales department. They'll process it today and your new service will be ready tomorrow. By next month, you'll really start to experience the savings. Fantastic. OK, well, that's all I wanted to know. Oh, when will I receive the bill? That'll be one month from the day you signed up. It'll be sent on the same day every month thereafter, unless you request a change. We can send them every two or three months if you prefer.
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a museum director talking to several student interns, explaining their internship duties at the museum. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Welcome to the City Museum of Art. I'm Dr. Shirley Johnson, the director of the museum's internship program. Today, I'll be giving you an orientation to the museum and our museum administrator's internship program. Will we get a chance to tour the museum today? Yes. We'll start right now with a tour of the building. We'll skip the basement. Most of that part of the building is devoted to art conservation, which won't be part of your internship. Let's begin here, on the ground floor, with the museum offices. I guess this is where we'll be spending most of our time, helping with the office work. You'll spend some time working in here so you can learn what the administrative duties involve, but you'll also get a chance to experience all aspects of museum work. This room in here is the Museum Tours Office. I'm interested in that. I'd really like to help out with the tours. That's great, because you'll all have a chance to lead some tours, and maybe even to develop a tour of your own, too. Let's go up to the second floor now. This is the boardroom in here, isn't it? Will we get to go to board meetings? Only members of the board of directors attend those. Now, back here behind the galleries are the classrooms. You're all welcome to attend any class you want at no charge. But we won't be teaching any, will we? No, the staff of the education department is responsible for that. Let's move up to the third floor now and the research department. Each of you will spend some time working in here. Great. I'd like to help with the research. We're working on some very interesting research projects right now. Also, as an extension of your research work, you'll probably contribute to some of the museum's brochures. I'm looking forward to that. I like writing about art. Another thing I've been hoping to be able to do is meet some artists. You're in luck, then. We've planned a reception for the first day of your internship, and you'll have the chance to meet several local artists then. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Could you give us a little background of the museum? I mean, when it was built and some information about the collections and things like that? Of course. The main part of the museum was built in 1895, 
with a combination of public and private funds. The new wing was built 60 years later with a donation from the Rhinebeck family. That part of the museum was built for the modern art collection, wasn't it? Yes, it was. In the main part of the museum, we have a gallery devoted to works by local artists, our sculpture collection, and a small collection of classical European art. You mentioned classes earlier. What kinds of classes does the museum offer? In our adult education program, we offer a series of art history classes. And for children, we have a program of arts and crafts workshops. You can get a brochure from the office that will give you more information. I saw a lot of chairs set up in the main hall. What are those for? Those are there for tonight's musical performance. We offer a weekly concert series during the fall and winter. And of course, all of you are welcome to attend. Now, if there are no more questions, let's step into my office and I'll show you your schedules. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear two university students discussing a social science lecture they attended. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Did you go to the first social science lecture yesterday? Yeah. Didn't you see me there? No. I was trying so hard to understand the lecturer. What didn't you understand? A lot of it, really. For example, he said we needed to study history as part of the course, but I didn't get why. You probably missed it. He said early on that we need to learn from our past mistakes. Right. But he also said we need to put ourselves in the place of our ancestors. Why is that? I think the point is that it's not enough to know how they lived and what they did. We need to know what they thought. I see. And I've written transferable skills in my notes next, but I have no idea what that means. If you study social science, you learn skills that you can use in a job. Oh, right. Is that all? Okay, but why is that? The point he made was that in studying social science, you use a flexible and adaptable approach to learning. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. He also kept mentioning all the other subjects we will need to study as part of the course. I didn't write them all down, did you? Some of them. I think I can make sense of my notes. The first one was anthropology, which he said would cover prehistory and archaeology as well. Okay. Then there's economics. I wrote down that this was not meant to mean that we will spend all our time looking at economic theory. 
but more that we need to see how humans behave. That's good. I don't think I could handle economic theory. He said something about education too, didn't he? Yeah, he said we'll be looking at how cultural information is handed down from one generation to the next through teaching children. He said we'd be focusing on geography too, but I can't really remember which aspects. Can you? I noted it down. I think. Here we are. Yes, particularly in relation to urban planning. It's law that I got confused about. I didn't understand why he linked that to economics. I think he meant that laws affect the way wealth is distributed. That makes sense. Now, what are the science wars? Okay, I did get that. The science wars are about how social science collects information. In sociology and social work, and in social science generally, they can only study patterns of behavior and observe. If you compare that to the way scientists work in physics or chemistry, it's very different because they use specific experiments that can be tested and which give concrete answers. Social studies is often accused of being unscientific. That's all. Okay, but it still looks like a good course, doesn't it? You don't have any regrets, do you? None at all. I'm looking forward to it. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Now let's turn to shopping, which may interest you more. In general, shops open at nine o'clock in the morning and close at five thirty in the afternoon. In country towns and quieter suburbs, smaller shops close for an hour at lunchtime, and once a week there tends to be an early closing day. When most shops shut during the afternoon, many cities have a late night once a week when shops stay open until approximately eight o'clock in the evening. You should ensure that anything you bring into the country, such as travelling irons, heated rollers, hair dryers, and electric shavers, can be used on the standard British voltage, which is two hundred and forty volts, fifty eight Z. Many hotels will, on request. Be able to supply adapters for electric shavers. When you travel, you may want to send postcards home. Stamps can be bought at post offices throughout Britain. They are open from nine o'clock to five thirty Monday to Friday, and until twelve thirty on Saturday. Stamps can also be bought at postal centre stamp dispensers, at large stores, and major tourist attractions. For posting letters. You don't have to go far before finding a red painted letterbox. Alternatively, use the letterboxes at post offices. You may ask how much to tip in hotels and how much it is for a taxi. There are no fixed rules on tariffs about this, and the following is intended only as a guide to customary practice. Most hotel bills include a service charge, usually ten to twelve percent, but in some larger hotels. Fifteen percent. 
Where a service charge is not included, it is customary to divide 10 to 15% of the bill among the staff who have given good service. In restaurants, if a service charge is not included in the bill, then 10 to 15% is usually left for the waiter. For porters, we usually give 30p to 50p per suitcase. For taxis, 10 to 15% of the fare. Hairdressers, £2 according to how much work they have done, plus 50p to the assistant who washed your hair. If you drive in Britain, you should remember to drive on the left and overtake on the right. The wearing of seatbelts is compulsory for the driver and front seat passengers. Now let's talk about full details of Britain's road regulations. A copy of the Highway Code can be obtained from offices of the Automobile Association, AA, or Royal Automobile Club, RAC, at most ports of entry. These two motoring organisations can also provide plenty of helpful information to all motorists. Contact AA. Telephone is 01 854 7373 24 hour service. RAC telephone is 0304 204 256 24 hour service. For something more serious, telephone operators will give you the telephone number and address of a local doctor's surgery. Alternatively, you can go to the casualty department of any general hospital or, in the case of severe emergency, dial 999. 999 is free. Remember, unless you belong to a European community country or one with which the UK has reciprocal health arrangements, you will be charged for the full cost of medical treatment in Britain, except in the case of accidents or emergencies requiring outpatient treatments only. It would therefore be wise to take out full medical insurance before leaving home. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.